for time lapse. <laughs> Hello, my lovelies, and welcome to my kitchen. Today, I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Um, I was starting to get a little bit stressy that I've got quite a lot uh, that I need to get done. Um, I've been wanting to make a couple of big meals, kind of Christmas is in a month. Um, so I wanted to cook a couple of big meals, stick them in the freezer and have them ready for uh, next month when we've got guests over. And I knew I wanted to record an episode as well. So I was trying to figure out which am I going to do first? What am I going to do? But then I thought multitasking. So um, we'll start in the kitchen. I'll show you my chili recipe and I'll answer a few of the uh, questions that a few viewers have uh, kindly asked. And then once the chili is kind of done, we'll head upstairs, I'll show you some awesome stash enhancements, um, I'll show you a little bit of what Gemma and I saw when we went to festival last week, and um, a couple of projects I've finished as well. So first, let's start with some food. So I'm a big fan of homemade chilies because it's just such a nice dish that you can really customize to whoever your audience is. So um, I'm making a veggie version because my sister is spending Christmas with us and uh, she's now, as much as possible, she's eating vegetarian. She's, she's nice and not picky in that if sometimes there's no veggie option at all, she might go for something like fish. But really, because I can, because I have the time, I fancied making a good veggie chili version and then I'm making a generously meaty one for everyone else. I'm going for a fairly um, kind of low spice version because we're gonna have my little nieces over and I want to make sure that it's fairly kid friendly. So I've kind of stashed up everything that's going in. We've got some courgettes, we've got some butternut squash, a bunch of peppers, mushrooms, uh, actually, I've got a lot more tomatoes than that, but that's a few of them that were already out the fridge. Um, for the veggie one, I'm going to use some soya mints. I've never used the dried version. I've always used the kind of uh, frozen corn one, but I've got this. I want to try and use it and see what it's like. Um, onions, carrots, more tomatoes, a um, whole stack of different beans. Um, I really like putting either butter beans or cannellini. Uh, red kidney beans and secret ingredient one tin of the Heinz baked beans um, and then I've got for the meaty one and the meaty one I've got one pack of sausages one pack of uh, turkey mints and one pack of lean beef mints um, sometimes we get uh, steak from the butcher and uh, turn that into our own mints but in this case I just got a nice big beef mints like that so I'm a bit of a kitchen nerd why, why, why am I showing you this? So I'm a bit of a kitchen nerd and I really like having some good, well-sharpened knives. It makes cooking so much more pleasant. So first I'm going to start with the butternut squash because I think that'll mostly go in the veggie chili, but I'll put a little bit probably in the meaty one as well. And I'm going to stick that in the oven for a little bit just to soften it, roast it, have a little bit of the crispy burnt well, not burnt, but you know, the crispy roasted bits, so that it adds extra flavor into the chili. So, long game, better start with this one. I hate cutting butternut squash, it's so hard. God, has anyone got a chainsaw? I'm giving you advance warning, I'm turning this kitchen into a bomb site. Moving on to veggies, I'm no longer, I'm not terrified to cut. I can actually start answering some questions. Um, so I'll start with an easy one. Annette asks, how long have you been knitting? So I started knitting about five years ago now. Uh, it was a bit of a 
an odd story in that I had discovered Ravelry, uh, kind of went the wrong way around. So I discovered Ravelry because of a sewing group originally, which I was interested in. So I joined Ravelry and I started speaking to the sewers and just by osmosis, all the knitting started interesting me. So I decided that I wanted to learn to knit. And uh, for some reason, I didn't even think of just going straight into Camp Cambridge. At that time, um, we didn't have a knitting shop, so the sheep shop wasn't there. But there was a big hobby craft or a big box store of that type. And uh, I never went to that shop. Instead, I looked for a tiny little shop that a lady ran from basically a shed in her back garden. And I drove out to her village. I went to meet her. She was absolutely wonderful. She helped me pick my first yarn. My She printed out a couple of patterns, free patterns from Ravelry. I remember the first thing I wanted to do was, uh, was a hat. So immediately she got me some circular needles and uh, kind of gave me a rough idea of how knitting in the round would work, which I'd then um, need to dig up on, on YouTube. But I knew, I knew I'd be able to learn on my own. So I picked up that yarn on a Saturday, and on the Monday, driving to work at 8 a.m., um, I was waiting for the person in front of me to cross traffic and turn uh, the car in front of me. Uh, we were completely stationary, and while we were waiting, the car in front of me just bashed straight into the back of my car at full speed. Um, it resulted in a whiplash. I mean, there was no blood, there was no big drama, it wasn't that bad, but it was enough that I had to spend kind of a couple of weeks at home uh, taking it easy because my neck and my back and everything was hurting and going, starting to go to physio. So during those two weeks, the first few days I spent kind of just recovering and de-stressing, but after that, what do you do all that time? So that's where I taught myself to knit. So I was sitting in bed and learning to knit. Um, and I think because I had the luxury of time, if you want to put it that way, um, I really managed to properly teach myself during that time, which means that afterwards it just had already become a bit of a way of life. And I haven't let go of the needle since. I've been knitting for those five years and I've just had such a fun time learning new stuff. I adore Ravelry for that. The fact that there's always something new, there's always somebody doing something interesting. So I probably wouldn't have encountered uh, color work and double knitting and so many interesting, slightly more, not necessarily modern, but modernized ideas um, that you know, I'm really glad that in that respect I managed to make good use of my time and uh, teach myself to knit. So there you go, five years is how long I've been knitting. Question number two comes from Nesting Instinct on Ravelry who um, asked me what, uh, what do I do in real life? So what do I do outside of this? Um, it's funny, I've, I've hesitated uh, talking about my real life job for the past few episodes because I didn't want it to feel like I was trying to promote or advertise or anything like that, but I suppose something like 13 episodes in, it's about time I talk about it. So um, my husband and I run our own software business. We've created an app for, uh, for Mac that's called Alfred, and uh, it's a great productivity app. It's free, so if you're on Mac, take a look. We started our business together coming on six years ago now, and previously we both worked in our respective fields. So he was a software developer and I was working in digital marketing. And I really enjoyed it. Um, I spent a few years consulting. I suppose I was a social media consultant. Laugh all you like, now everyone and their dog tries to be a social media consultant. But when I started about 10 years ago, trying to explain and qualify and quantify the value of something like a blog or a social media account to a company was really strange. It, to them it just felt like, oh, that's, some, that's a fad that teenagers like and uh, it just wasn't a thing that businesses would do. Nowadays, as we all know, every company has a Twitter account, every business uh, maintains a blog with their news. It's just the way it goes, but back then it was quite a an interesting thing to try to explain to companies and try and get them to do it well, not be some kind of snake oil salesman who's trying to pitch you something weird, but really 
actually connect with people. So I loved it, I really enjoyed it, but uh, six years ago we decided that we'd do it for ourselves instead. And with our Mac app, we've got just such a brilliant community of, well, millions of users. In one way, I'm never not working. There's always something to do. There's always somebody who needs an answer. And because our users are all around the world, it can be any time of day or night and you'll have a user in California or in Japan or in Australia. You've always got somebody in some time zone who wants some help. So it's been really exciting sometimes a bit exhausting and uh, at the same time I wouldn't change it for the world. I just love being my own boss and I'm not sure that anyone really <laughs> would be able to uh, convince me to go back to an office. Maybe one day, but at, this, at the moment we absolutely love being our own bosses. What does sometimes drive me crazy is people who say, oh aren't you lucky? Luck has nothing to do with it. Working your butt off every day is what makes the difference between working for somebody else and going home at the end of the day and just saying mm, that's good that's good i'll come back tomorrow think about it tomorrow and running your own business where it becomes your life it becomes really important for you to put the thought into it um, because nobody else is going to do it for you there's no manager who's going to take over while you go and take a holiday so it's really it's not luck it's a choice and it's hard work and i know in crafts, there are so many people who do a great job of it, so many people who choose to be their own bosses, to sell online or to go to events and sell their own yarn, sell, sell their own handmade stuff. And that's what it's all about, it's being in control of your own life and that's what excites me about it. Okay. So next question, we're going to go on to the lighter questions. Um, I got a question about last week's video and what the hummingbird shawl pin I was wearing was. Um, it's a very special pin. It's uh, by Skin Queen, or rather it's sold by Skin Queen, but it's made by a common friend of ours, um, Rowena, who makes, it, who makes uh, these shawl pins with her brother in France. And the reason I really like them, I'm never big on pins that have an actual pin because um, I end up stabbing myself with it. I'm pretty clumsy. Um, these ones instead are magnetic. So you have the front with two little magnets on the back and you have a back section that you put on the other side of your shawl that contains the two opposing magnets so they all stick together. And what I love is that you're also not pinning anything through the knitting. You're not making holes in your shawl. It's not so bad if it's a lace shawl, but if it's a uh, kind of uh, fuller stitches shawl, I don't like putting the pins through and then it gets kind of stretched out. And final question, has recording a craft show changed the way you, uh, you do things? So talk about my crafts. Um, yeah, you guys have made me more accountable for finishing projects. I'm pretty sure that since I've started the, ep the uh, recording episodes, even though I spend a fair amount of time having to edit these shows. Um, I do think I get, I'll probably get more productive knitting done. So I'll start a project and I'll actually finish it. Um, I can't, can't wait to show you. I've finished a few, uh, a few this week. We'll go upstairs in a bit. The other part of that question was uh, whether recording the podcast has changed between the first episode and now and unquestionably anyone who who started uh, any activity in a regular way it becomes a lot more natural and it becomes a lot easier so I'd say things like the editing and things like um, getting myself organized for for the episodes it's definitely getting a lot quicker and um, certainly I find I have learned to do editing and final cut in a way that I find more productive um, one thing that hasn't changed is uh, talking to myself on the camera. That always feels, feels weird. And setting up, setting up a whole light setup in my kitchen, yeah, that still feels weird. But hey, it's good fun. Next time I do a q and A, I'll be in very, very special company. So in just over a week's time, I'll be meeting... So in just over a week, there will be a very special q and A. It will be a and a with Stephen West, who is running a class at the Cheap Shop in Cambridge. So 
Uh, you've asked me some great questions. I've enjoyed answering them. Now, I would love your help coming up with some great questions to ask Stephen West in a week's time. So pop your questions in the comments and I'll pick a few of my favorite ones to ask Stephen next week. Because it's Christmas, I'm indulging a little in this one. So it has uh, beef, it has turkey, and it's got sausages in. My normal chili doesn't have that much, but because it's Christmas, I thought, let's just go all out. The veggie one, the butternut squash is already in, and uh, I'm just about to put a little bit of wine in it. Not too much, just a little bit. And then I might have to have a glass too. There's food on my camera. <laughs> I'll have to come back when the mushrooms start shrinking and the courgettes start shrinking because currently there's no room for anything and I haven't even put any of the uh, tin tomatoes or any of the beans and I haven't put any of the uh, soy mints in the veggie one. Right, I think that's everything. I'm going to leave everything to simmer for half an hour or so, come give it a good stir every so often Oops. and uh, probably leave it to cook for another hour or so in total and then I'll let it cool and then I can package it up in uh, small portions. Alright, so it's been about two hours and the chilli is basically done. I've got the veggie chilli, I've added some spices about half an hour ago and there's the meaty chilli which is also all good and well. As promised, the description is... Uh, the description's in the recipe. Mm. As promised, the recipe's in the description, so if you fancy making a chili, let me know how it goes. We've now warped upstairs, and in fact it might be a whole different day after making the chili. What can I say? I got cozy on the sofa. I wanted to share a few yarn stash enhancements um, after attending Festival. So last weekend I went with my friend Gemma to Festival in Hitchin and it was uh, actually surprisingly big. It's the first time that uh, I was attending that event. In fact, I'm not sure how many years it's been going for. Um, but there were some very interesting and in fact quite different uh, stall holders compared to some of the events I've attended in the past. Of course some re some faces that I recognized but um, it was nice to have a little bit of variety. So while we were there we uh, had a look at the stand by the lovely Louise at Spin City who uh, was quite happily happy as ever, um, showing people how to start uh, spinning with a spindle. So that was quite nice to see. How, how do you start? Where do you start teaching people? Um, we also had a nice little snoop around one stall who was selling uh, solar dyeing uh, kits, so glass bottle, yarn or fibre and uh, the kind of methodology to learn to uh, do solar dyeing. It's something I've never done, it's something uh, Gemma hadn't done either and we were both quite curious about it. Um, might be something for next summer, apparently you can do it during winter but it takes longer because obviously there's a lot less sun. So I think it might be something I'll try next summer. Um, I've always done my dyeing using acid dyes, which give, gives you those bright, bold colors. Um, but it would be interesting to get a different look to the yarn, a different color scheme by using the, those natural dyes. Um, beyond that, there were just, it was a very colorful event, lots of uh, great yarn, lots of uh, extremely enthusiastic and very very welcoming uh, stall holders. I'll probably attend again. It was definitely a pleasant event.
Gemma, would you like to do a bit of crochet? Oh my god, that's massive. <laughs> <laughs> They look very Winnie the Pooh, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of stash, of course. Let's see, what did I acquire there? Well, I was actually a very good girl while I was there. And I, the only skein that I bought, the only yarn I bought, is this absolutely beautiful um, sparkle duck skein. So it's um, Tempest, which is uh, silk, mohair and nylon. And uh, a similar yarn is the Fiber Spates Fairy Wings. So it's got that same uh, halo. The colors are just almost, they feel like they're pearlescent. It's so gorgeous. So that will make some kind of nice shawl uh, for somebody who likes mohair because it definitely is a little bit floofier than some of uh, the other yarns that I like to use. Um, but I think it's got a lot of promise. Don't know what I'll make with it yet. Um, my other stash acquisition um, actually has nothing to do with festival balls. <sighs> Sorry, mohair face. Um, and it's uh, not so much an addition as a replacement of something that was in my stash. So I exchanged with a fellow Skeen Queen uh, fan uh, a couple of skeins. So she took the pink um, flockly that I wasn't planning on using and instead she sent me her slinky twist in Isle of Bliss which is part of uh, the club this quarter that I'm not, I'm not part of. But of course that's just how it goes. When you don't join the club, it's always during that particular quarter that every yarn that comes out, you just want. So I've been doing a few swaps. I'm actually, I've got my eye on this month's one as well. Um, my hair is making me sneeze. <coughs> the other thing I got from Festival is uh, various buttons um, from the textile garden stand. It seems like every time Maggie from textile garden is at an event I can't help it. I have to stop and pick up a few buttons. Um, there's one set in particular I found interesting. They looked like wood to me and I thought well what happens when I want to wash the garment? Um, can the buttons be wet? Are they going to be okay? And it turns out they're not made out of wood, they are made of coconut shell. So they can withstand being wet. Of course you wouldn't soak them for a long time, but they can withstand being wet. The lovely little birds. And then some have trees on and some have a kind of pearlescent flower. So um, nice button acquisition. I'm sure they'll go on some cardigan in the future, um, but it wasn't bought with a particular project in mind quite yet. Now onto the works in progress and the finished objects. So I showed you the pair of socks that I was working on and I have now finished them and I absolutely love them. So these are in Colinette Jitterbug with a contrast heel colour. Um, I made these using the favourite socks uh, pattern by Vullenvine and they, I still need to weave the ends in, but I couldn't find a blunt needle, so I've ordered one, and as soon as that arrives, I'll be blocking them and I'll be, um, I'll be weaving all the ends in. In fact, I'm gonna have to have a blocking party this week because I've got these. I have the hat that I finished a few weeks ago that's really cute, the carousel-in. Um, I have a shawl that my friend Carrie made that I said I would uh, block for her so that I could show you how to block a crochet shawl, and... I'm sure I had a fourth project. Something else that needs blocking. Of course, the last project that I need to block is my Ishbel, which I've finished. Again, ends to be woven in, but it's done. And I absolutely love the colors. I really had fun doing the um, five rows of beading. Um, 
the only thing that I'm slightly miffed about is that I made the small version and as a result I have this much yarn left. This I haven't weighed it but this must be probably 40 grams easily so I could have added quite a few rows and still had yarn to spare. Um, I did the small version because that's what was recommended when you're using fingering weight and you have a 400 gram, uh, 400 gram, a 400 meter skein. Um, but I definitely could have made it a little bit bigger. So I'm likely to do the Ishbel again and probably do it where I've got sufficient yarn left over that I can. I can just keep going for as long as I like, um, so that it's quite a lot bigger. I mean, it's still it's still good, but it's certainly a charlotte. So this is going to get blocked as well this week. Um, I really like the the way you can block it really quite heavily, so that the lace all opens up. So that should look really good when it's done. So that's four things I need to block. On the note of having too much yarn left after finishing project, um, I had worried originally that uh, 100 grams wouldn't be enough for my pair of socks, and um, in the end, I have this much left. It's just, it's just completely crazy. I really need to stop worrying about running out of yarn. What's the worst case scenario? You do an edging that's in a slightly different colour, or you finish at the point where you know you've only got a tiny bit left. But really, that's just crazy. I must have, again, I must have used about 60 grams to make the socks and I've got all of this left. And from the heel colours, I've also got this left. So I've pretty much got enough for another whole pair of socks. In terms of uh, works in progress, it's also been a pretty good week. As I finished one pair of socks, I had to cast on another one because I've just really got the bug for socks at the moment. So I have started these, which are grey and burgundy. So the grey is sparkly and just a little stripe of burgundy. Um, I'll also do the heel and toe with the with the burgundy colour. I'm roughly following the number of stitches from the favourite socks, the Vulunvine one, but I think I'll probably do a regular short row heel and not quite sure about the toe, I think just the same toe that I did for the other ones. Um, but I'm still trying to find a heel that feels right and comfortable and nice and easy to, to do. So I think a short row heel is a little bit more my thing than necessarily the heel flap that I did on the other one. I also pulled back out my Coronis um, sweater, nice cropped sweater from Pom Pom that I had uh, worked on, got the whole body done, and um, while doing the ribbing I switched to smaller needles as you're supposed to do, but I completely forgot and started making the sleeve using the smaller needles. So it had been in the naughty corner for a few weeks while, um, or a few months in fact, um, because I knew that I'd have to pull back about 15 rows and restart the sleeve in, in the right uh, needle size. Um, and finally I got around to doing that last week. So I'm now going to try and finish it up so that I can wear it over Christmas. It's quite a nice fit, kind of round neck, cropped, so um, would look good with kind of an A-line dress or a kind of puffy skirt or something. Not that I have any puffy skirts, but I like to dream. So that's pretty much my works in progress. Um, oh, in fact, no. I also, as I finished my Ishbel, I wanted something quick and just kind of satisfying, and I decided to cast on a hat in this pink angora. It's so soft. It's just like, it's like, mm, wonderful. So I'm making a very simple little hat. Uh, I haven't quite decided. I'm winging the pattern as I go. Um, originally I was thinking of making either the tiny owl knits, um, Orchids and Fairy Tales, or the Parcel Tongue, one of her two hats that uh, I think she's also made in that kind of pink, so I think that's why I thought about it. Um, but in the end I've decided to just do a really simple hat with probably one, uh, one cabled braid down the side, um, because I think it, it's so soft and so fluffy that it wouldn't have a whole lot of definition if I did make the whole thing cabled, so I think I'll just keep it simple. It fluffs on everything. I'm wearing black jeans and now they're black with pink fluff, but um, I think it'll be really nice and warm to wear this winter. And if I like it, I might put a big white pom-pom on the top. As I mentioned earlier, 
the episode next week will be very special because I'll be at the Sheep Shop in Cambridge for the Stephen West uh, shawl workshop and then I'll be asking Stephen some questions so I would love for you to let me know what your questions are for Stephen what you'd like me to ask him and I'll pick and choose a few a few of your best questions um, for the little interview that I'll do with him a quick tip when watching on YouTube uh, some people are struggling to find the comment section um, you'll find it on the iPad and on the iPhone below the recommended videos so on the iPad you'll see it down the sidebar just scroll past the recommended videos and you will find the comment section um, it's a little bit tricky it's a little bit hidden but once you've found it you'll be able to uh, leave a comment and leave your questions if you can't do that of course just pop by the Ravelry group and uh, post your question there and I'll be keeping an eye on any questions that come through. So as ever you can say hi on Twitter, I'm Vero, and on Ravelry and Instagram as that Canadian girl. Don't forget to subscribe and give the video a big thumbs up and I'll see you next week. Bye bye!